Ladies and gentlemen, before we start the meeting, now we will watch a video of Shenzhen.
Honorable Secretary General, official seniors, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to extend a very warm welcome to Shenzhen, Guangdong Province, China, for the second IKEA Next Generation of Aviation Professional Global Summit. My name is Katalin Radu and I'm the Deputy Director in charge with aviation safety in ICAO and the Global NGAP Coordinator and I'll be your Master of Ceremony for the event. Our summit this week is being hosted by the Shenzhen Municipal People's Government of Guangdong Province, the Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics and supporting by Beihang University. We have an exciting few days ahead of us including a number of special activities that will take place during the summit, such as the Model IKEA Forum for college and university students who are interested in aviation, Aviation University Forum, including the signing ceremony tomorrow, the information session on future airport development presented by the Shenzhen Municipal Government, as well as the IKEA's virtual reality experience. As we get started, I would be grateful if you kindly turn off or place on silent mode your telephone or other electronic equipment that might distract from the proceedings. This week, approximately 1,000 participants are joining, represented over 32 member states of IKEO and 12 international organizations from all around the world. And together, we will explore the challenging world of the future needs of aviation. But before inviting our special speakers to make their opening remarks, please let me recognize some of the honorary guests. Dr. Liu Fang, Secretary General International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, Mr. Li Jian, Deputy Administrator, Civil Aviation Administration of China. Mr. Chen Rugui, Mayor of Shenzhen. Mr. Lin Zhuoming, President of Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Ms. Cao Shumin, Chairman of University Council Beihang University, Ms. Lydia Chikunga, Deputy Minister of Transport South Africa, Mr. Sergei Gutkov, the representative of the Russian Federation in the IKEA Council, Mr. Nimal Siri, Director General of CAA of Sri Lanka, and Ms. Poppy Koza, Director General of the CAA South Africa, together with Patrick Peters, CEO and President of IFATCA. Just a few uh, of, of our honorary guests that are today with us. And now, without further ado, it is my great pleasure and honor to invite IKEA Secretary General, Dr. Liu Fang, to share her opening remarks. of Civil Aviation of China, CAC. Mr. Lu Gui Chen, Mayor of Shenzhen. Mr. Zhu Minglin, President of CSAA. Ms. Zhu Ming Zhao, Chairman of University Council, Beihang University. Ms. Linda Sindasui Shinkonga, Deputy Minister of Transport, South Africa. Director General of Civil Aviation Authorities. Representative of IKEO Council. Representative of Industry. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. my great pleasure to welcome you today to the second annual IKEA Next Generation of Aviation Professionals or NGAP Global Summit. First of all, I would like to thank for Shenzhen Municipality 
for your generous support for this event, and thanks for your thoughtful arrangement too. At the same time, I also would like to thank for the Beihang University and the Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics. I also would like to thank for the Civil Aviation Administration of China for your great support for this event. We can say that Shenzhen is a front city for the scientific development and the innovation, and Shenzhen is now become the international portal for the technology and the development. In 2016, in the 35-year plan of the aviation industry guideline, the Chinese government has proposed that Shenzhen will be gradually upgraded as an international transport hub for the aviation industry. As far as I know that in recent years, the passenger throughput of Shenzhen International Airport has been grown by two-digit number every year, and it will be very likely in 2025 the passenger throughput in Shenzhen International Airport would be five times higher than what we have today. The fast growth of the civil aviation industry were in need of the talent. How can we attract the aviation professionals to realize the sustainable development of our industry? is a challenge to Shenzhen City. It is also a great challenge for all the civil aviation industrial practitioners. And uh, this is also a very important topic we're going to continue to discuss in the next three days. Last year in Montreal, sought to begin generating momentum among industry, governments, and academia on this topic. Our collective goal there was to ensure that future air transport network will be able to attract and retain the best and the brightest that our coming generations have to offer. This is a very critical priority in aviation today and in every corner of the world because consistent with the historical trends, the aviation network is continue to grow and to serve more and more communities and businesses today. It is growing so steadily, in fact, that we presently forecast current flight and passenger volumes to double by just the middle 2030s. Here in China, the pace will be ever faster with air operations traveling during the same period. This means globally that each and every day, commercial aviation will be moving 20 million passengers on more than 200,000 daily flights in less than 15 years' time. This is truly a momentum challenge for air transport leaders and planners today and one which is presently engaging our entire global community in every aspect of aviation's strategic, technological, and operational development. This is because air transport's contributions to the peace and the prosperity of nations and to their sustainable social economic development has never been more important or pervasive from the global standpoint than it is today. Even as I speak to you today, here, the global civil aviation sector is supporting the successful employment and the rewarding careers of more than 65 million people all over the world. At the same time, it is generating no less than 2.7 trillion US dollars in global GDP. Much of this economic impact is due to the uniquely rapid and reliable aspects of air transport, the very same qualities which has seen it become so relied upon for 90% of the e-commerce activity in the world today. Air transport connections bring supplies together with producers, carry producers' products to markets they couldn't otherwise access, and of course, 
It's a critical enabler of the travel and tourism, which more and more countries rely on now for their economic health and vitality. Some 55% of the world's 1.3 billion international tourism arrive at their destinations in aircraft today. And this is especially relevant for the world's many small islands, economies, for whom tourism and aviation connectivity more generally represent a veritable lifeline of economic growth and development. Taken together, IQ has demonstrated that international aviation connections deliver systemic and fundamental economic benefits to the countries of the world. Indeed, of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals now being pursued by governments as part of the United Nations Agenda 2030, focused on poverty reduction, environment stewardship, gender parity, educational access, and many other noble social economic aims. Fully 15 are directly and positively impacted by this state's dependable access to ACAO compliant international civil aviation. The scope and level of these contributions clearly underscore for us why current and future air transport growth must be supported by aeronautically proficient aircraft designers, systems engineers, pilots and navigators, and by just as adept managers and leaders. Several key challenges will need to be addressed as we work toward these objectives. For instance, at the same time our sector is growing, its workforce is also shrinking due to the inevitable demographics of aging populations, lowering birth rates, and other attrition factors. This means few air transport professionals being available to pilot future aircraft and to effectively maintain and manage our ever-expanding fleet. These challenges to air transport workforce planning are further aggravated by the increasing number of high-tech careers in other industry sectors which compete with aviation for up-and-coming technical talent. This and similar dynamics have forced us to recognize that aviation has to do a much better job of both attracting and retaining the skilled workers and managers it requires. ACAO has recently updated its forecast for pilots, air traffic controllers, and aircraft technicians. Our numbers have revealed that no less than 620,000 pilots will be needed by 2036 to fly the world's 100 seat and larger aircraft. But even more important than this figure is that the fact of 80% of these future aviators will be new in entrance to this profession who are not yet flying today. A similar story is playing out with respect to the future air traffic controllers, maintenance personnel, and other technicians needed. But we should recall that these are just some of the literal hundreds of direct and indirect aviation related career categories which will potentially be impacted. Another important priority to be addressed is how to guide the balanced movement of aviation professional between countries and employees. This is important in order to ensure that all states and regions have dependable aviation workforces at their disposal. It was for all of these
these reasons and more that Akil launched the next generation of aviation professionals and GAP initiative, mainly to bring the aviation, education, and the labor sectors together and assess the scale of the challenge before us. Today, we are organizing and attuning our NGAP program activities to the more specific needs of Akil's various strategic objectives for aviation safety, security and facilitation, and navigation capacity and efficiency, economic development, and environmental sustainability. Later in this summit, we will be hearing a little more about specific developments from each of these areas. We have also lately welcomed some new strategic partners into the NGAP fold so that we can broaden our focus to a wider range of aviation professions and develop stronger links with the related United Nations global goals. As you will have seen from your programs, there are also a number of NGAP associated events during the next three days, two of which are specific to Akil. In the spirit of inspiring future aviation professionals, parallel to the NGAP Global Summit, we are running a model Akil Forum. This is designed to allow local and international university students to explore today's key global aviation priorities and challenges through a case study competition assisted by Akil technical experts. The Model Akil Forum commenced this morning and 180 participating students have joined us now for the opening of the summit. I propose that we give a special round of applause to warmly welcome the students, our next generation. I look forward to hearing of the outcomes of the Model Akil Forum and announcing the winning team to you at the closing session of this summit. I would also like to invite you to explore Akio's virtual reality experience located in the booth just outside this hall. We truly are entering a bold new era of aviation innovation. And this virtual reality display will provide an introduction to some of the amazing aircraft and operations which will be traveling our skies in the years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, let me please remark again on how this is such a very exciting time in the history of aviation and just as exciting moment for those of us involved in finding new ways to assure a dedicated and qualified next generation of aviation professionals and GAP. One such example was the many international universities who met here early this morning to discuss the benefits of a new association of higher education institutions known as Alicanto, which will be focused on our shared and gap priorities. I greatly commend this initiative and look forward to joining you and learning more about this development on day two of our summit program. This and the rest of our work here in Shenzhen will be making an important impact on the future mobility and prosperity of many developed and developing societies all over the world. And we should not lose sight of that as we embark on this journey. As you consider and appreciate these quite challenging objectives, may I please wish you all a very productive and engaging summit and thank once again our very generous Chinese partners who have made it all possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Next, let us please welcome Mr. Li Jian, 
Deputy Administrator at the Civil Aviation Administration of China. Respected um, Secretary General Liu Feng, respected Mayor Chen Ruhui, respected Director Lin Zhuming, respected Director Cao Su, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to meet all of you in the city of Shenzhen to discuss the cultivation and the nurturing of the next generation of aviation professionals. First of all, being entrusted by the director Feng Zhengling on behalf of this uh, CAA um, China Aviation Administration to extend my warmest gratitude to the Kyo, the Shenzhen Municipal of uh, municipal government, the Beihang University. Thank you for your invitation, and I would like to deliver my warmest congratulations to the successful opening of this forum. I would also like to extend my warmest greeting to all the distinguished guests and friends participating in this forum. Shenzhen is the youngest city in China, and along with the China's reform and opening up, it started to grow continuously, and in the 40th anniversary of the China's reform and opening up, we welcome all of the aviation colleagues together here and to discuss the cultivation of the next generation of aviation pro uh, professionals to talk about our experience as well as best practices and to jointly discuss our future challenges is of great significance. Aviation industry is a strategic industry for economic and social development. During the past 40 years of China's reform and opening up, China is growing in economic power, and the civil aviation has also continuously improved its capacity of safe operation, transportation, service quality. And it grew in an unprecedented speed. It contributed greatly to the economic development as well as social development for China. It also contributed to the growth of the global aviation industry. Since 1978 till now, China aviation industry total throughput, passenger throughput, cargo throughput has maintained a 16 point 3%, 15.2%, and 12.4% of annualized growth for 40, 40 consecutive years, so which is unprecedented in the world. For the flight total throughput of the member countries of the ICAO has increased from the number 37 in 1978 to increase for 13 consecutive years to number two since the year of 2005. Currently, China's civil aviation remains a growth in a steady manner, for the industry has a very strong demand. The development of the industry has been striking. For China, we maintain our position as one of the most potential and wide um, and active aviation market. We have the intention as well as the confidence to build a more effective, safer, green, open sky and to contribute to the Bell and Road Initiative and the mutual connection of the aviation as well as the prosperity of the global aviation industry. And 
talent is vital for one, any country as well as any industry. During our development, we felt that talent has been one of the key issues for the prosperity of, of our industry. China's civil aviation attached great importance to the cultivation of the talents, and we had explored greatly to this extent, as well as learned some experience and yield positive results. In terms of the numbers of talents, currently there are 700,000 av civil aviation professionals, including pilots, for the maintenance, air stewards, as well as other professional talents. Among which, and these are the um, some of the professionals has more than 200,000 people. In the meantime, we actively partner with the relevant government organization as well as local uh, government to build uh, civil aviation colleagues as well as disciplines in various educational institutions. Currently, there are more than 20,000 students running about uh, stewards as well as air control. And currently, there are uh, close to 1 million professionals being trained and close to 6,000 supervisors being trained every year. And we also attach great importance to the um, perfectionism, craftsmanship, as well as the comprehensive capacities, their quality and qualifications. We continuously lay a very good fundamental work for the uh, talents to enhance the education and occupational training for the frontline workers to enhance their capacity of safe operation. Part of this has supported the China civil aviation's rapid and continuous development. In the future, we are going to continue to strengthen our cultivation of the talents. It is expected that in the coming several years, we are going to gather more than 15 billion RMB for the building of the civil aviation senior educational institutions as well as the innovative platforms of such universities. I believe that to do the cultivation of talents well, first of all, we need to base on the current development status of our own country and to emphasize on a pragmatic innovation and to establish a a talent cultivating uh, work organism that matches its current developmental stages and in the recruiting, cultivation, utilization, evaluation, and stimulation uh, incentives, we need to continuously improve the comprehensive system and to build a team that fits the demand of our own industry with a appropriate scale, a good structure, and high quality. Other than that, we need to have a broader vision to enhance the cooperation with international civil aviation associations. China Civil Aviation Association is a member of a ICAO as a uh, first category member state. We played active work to the development of the organization. In last May, the Bell Road International Cooperative Summit, the uh, CAA and ICAO actually signed a cooperative intention and to ensure all the member states can catch up and to closely link it with the Bell Road Initiative and to focus on promoting the talent development of the professionals in the Bell Road countries with the mechanism of self-self development. The Chinese government has provided four million US dollars of donation to ICAO to hold a developing country's mid to senior level talent training um, projects, and we provide the training for close to 500 civil aviation management professionals from uh, more than 30 country states. And to greatly contribute to the safe operation of the um, participating countries. And it 
takes 10 years to, be, to grow a tree and 100 years to grow a talent. It takes a long time to grow a talent. As that we are hoping that with the leadership of the ICAO, with the continuous effort of the C Civil Aviation Administration, with our effort of expanding cooperation, improving the capacity of cooperation, we can jointly contribute to the next generation aviation professionals cultivation and to contribute to the sustainable development to the aviation industry. Last but not least, I would like to wish this summit a great success. And I will also wish you a happy stay in Shenzhen. Thank you. And uh, now it's uh, our great pleasure to welcome Mr. Lin Zhuoming, the president of the Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Mr. Lin, the floor is yours. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, with the joint effort of the International Society, the second higher next generation of aviation perform professionals global summit is being successfully held in Shenzhen, China today. Here, on behalf of the CSAA, China Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all of the dear friends from all over the world. Fly is the permanent dream of the humanity for the CSAA is the only national level um, civil organization in China. We bear the important mission of educating the public of the aviation knowledge as well as the development of industry. After generation as this effort, we already connected all of the main organizations and institutions of China in terms of aviation as well as tens of thousands of individuals. We conduct academic communication as well as educational sections. We invited generation and generations of aviation practitioners. And today, we gather here and to discuss global cooperation, national strategy, talent cultivating system, as well as the opportunity brought by the new technologies. And it is a rare opportunity for us to discuss this issue and with, with great significance. The result is instrumental for the development of the China's aviation industry as well as the cultivating talents. We sincerely hope that you can conduct a th thorough communication and possibly the CSAA will continue to carry on our mission of serving the development of global aviation talents as well as enhancing our cooperation with various aviation associations and together with the Central government as well as the Shenzhen, uh, as well as the Beihan University to contribute our effort. As well as this, I would like to wish this meeting a great success. Thank you. Please welcome Ms. Cao Shumin, the chairman of the University Council at Beihang University. Distinguished Secretary General Madame Liu Changfang, distinguished.
distinguished Mr. Li Jian, Major Chen Rugui, distinguished Lin Zuoming, and then distinguished Qi Kunjia. Lydia Chikunjia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here to take part in the second ICAO Next Generation of Aviation Professionals Summit. As one of the organizers, I'd like to, on behalf of Beihang University, to welcome all of you to be here with us today. I'd like to thanks for the ICAO of choosing Shenzhen to be the host city of this great event. I also would like to thank for Shenzhen Municipality and the Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics for your great efforts. In recent years, the aviation industry in the whole world is developing dramatically. Aviation as a way is promoting the connectivities of all countries and it also made huge impact over our social and economic development. The aviation industry is in face of the two opportunities for the enlarged scale, and but we're also in face of challenges like safety and the sustainable development. We are in need of huge volume of the talents. In this regard, ICAO initiated this ground event, which is providing a platform to the government, training institute, companies, and the higher educational institute to work together to talk about the strategies for our aviation professionals and Education. China is the second largest aviation transport country in the world. As an active participant of the aviation industry, a executor of the aviation strategies, China has already made a great contribution to the aviation industrial development in order to realize a sustainable and high growth. And in order, we need to observe the new technological result and to focus on the education, to really focus on the generation, next generation of aviation professionals. Beihang University is the first higher educational institute of the aviation industry in China. It's been called as a cradle for the Chinese aviation engineers. Since the establishment a few decades ago, we are the key university in China. We were in the program 211 and 985, and we saw regarded as a world top class university. We help to nurture and train around 200,000 aviation professionals in the past few decades. In order to become the world class university, we would like to work on the engineering, science and development, and the humanitarian disciplines to have the cross discipline development for the past few years. We are also trying to build the high quality teaching staff to build a good curriculum so as to improve the quality of the students for both teaching and learning. Beihang University is a university with engineering, science, and humanities teaching, especially on IT and aviation side. We have our own advantages to this place. Beihang University is bringing the talent training and the scientific development together to make sure that the students development and the professionalism can all be helped to form a very unique talent training model in order to support av aviation industrial development in aviation traffic management, aviation technology, aviation communication, drones, safety, big data, and aviation laws are our focused area for research. Beihang University also established our flying school so as to cultivate the high and pilot for the civil aviation industry. We have successfully trained 6,000 pilots, where at the same time, Beihang University also attaches great importance to the educational program. In 1958, we started to have the first journal, that is aviation knowledge. This journal then be chaired by Chinese Society of uh, Aeronautics and uh, astronautics, and we published around 100 million units of the journal, which is a great impact in the Chinese society. Different generations of the juveniors due to this journal entered into the aviation industry to fulfill their career mission, and we also have the bilingual monthly journal, we call it is Chinese Journal of Aeronautics, and now this journal has already become a very important 
and a platform for the knowledge and experience sharing and uh, with a very good influence factor. It's now being regarded as a tier one world journal in the aviation industry. As we are cultivating the talents, we stick to the international strategy. And now we have already worked with more than 200 universities, high and research institute, and multinational corporations for the long term and stable partnership. We are also a part of the World uh, Aviation Association. And we also established the China French Engineering Academy, International Academy, and the General Aviation Academy. Currently, we have more than 2,000 students from 110 countries and regions that are being exchanged to our school. And uh, we are also seeking for the new models for the Thailand training. We are working with uh, Moscow Civil Aviation Technology University of Russia and uh, Malino University, as well as ENAC for the high and joint training of the Thailand. Well, at the same time, we are also working with Airbus, as well as Boeing, China Southern Airline, China International Airline, especially the industrial practitioners, to work with them for the close cooperation to try and understand what is needed by the industry by modify our curriculum to build a deep tie with the industrial practitioners so as to promote the technical support and the talent development for the industry in 2014 the UN it set up a new office at Beihang University. We helped calculate 260 post doctor post graduate students and 1,500 uh, aviation talents from different countries. Beihang University attaches great importance of our tie with ICAO, and we keep a very close relationship and also sign the MOU. We are going to work with ICAU on the uh, traffic management, big data, as well as the research, joint research work in the near future with great support from IQ and uh, Beihang University will continue to serve the civil aviation development in China and in the whole world so as to contribute our wisdom to the next generation of the aviation professionals education. Last but not least, thanks for being here with us today and I also would like to wish the second IQ next generation of aviation professionals summit a great with success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Chao. And now, finally, let us please welcome Mr. Chen Rugui, Mayor of the great city of Shenzhen. Mr. Chen. I would like to welcome all of you to come to Shenzhen to participate in the second IQ Next Generation of Aviation Professionals Global Summit. First of all, please allow me on behalf of the Shenzhen Municipal Government to give our warm congratulations to all the guests being here with us today. And today's event is a ground gathering for the international civil aviation industry, which will promote the exchange and collaboration for the international civil engineering talents. Especially, it will also play a very important meaning for the Shenzhen, because Shenzhen really wants to build itself in an, as an international aviation hub. Shenzhen is is a mega city with the spirit of innovation, and Shenzhen is also a very important innovation center, economic center, as well as the window of reform and opening up in China. And uh, currently, Shenzhen has around 20 million under the government management. In the last year, the 
GDP as a whole in Shenzhen region reached 2.24 trillion RMB, grew by 8.8 percent, and our economic aggregate is uh, ranking at the top five among all Asia cities. In the first three quarters this year, our GDP growth is 8.1 percent as an average. We keep a very good momentum for further development. And for Shenzhen, the R&D investment accounted for 4.35 percent of the total GDP and are almost the same as that of the Israel, the top one in the world. And I can say that emerging economy accounted for 60 percent of the total GDP. Currently, we have 40,000 high-tech national enterprises, and uh, the high-tech industry contributed 34 percent of the total economic development, and the high-tech industry growth rate is around 12.7 percent. Shenzhen is also a very important aviation hub for China, and currently Shenzhen has its aviation connects with 167 cities, covering almost the major cities in and outside China. And, uh, According to our estimation, this year our passenger throughput would be around 50 million RMB, grow by 8 percent. Our cargo uh, throughput would be around 1.2 million tons from the aviation hub. And in the near future, with the construction of the Greater Bay Area, and uh, the aviation industry in Shenzhen would, uh, in face of huge demand from the society, we are now leveraging the high standards in building the third. Uh, take of line, the T4 terminal, and the satellite hall as the fundamental infrastructures for the aviation service to create the high world class aviation and the portal economic area to expand our international connectivity. We hope that we can leverage the support from the Civil Aviation Administration of China to deploy the resources in the right way so that to create the tier one greater region aviation resources cluster. And currently, Shenzhen is carefully implement and study the statement that has been made by President Xi Jinping when he come to visit Shenzhen and visit the Guangdong province. We were much towards with the spirit of constructing the China featured communist pilot area, and then to make sure that we could become a city example for the socialism modernized development. We would like to leverage this summit as a great opportunity to consolidate our collaboration with ICAO as well as our industrial practitioners and to create the enabling environment for the aviation organizations, enterprises in Thailand to create you a good environment so that we can join hands to train and to nurture the next generation of aviation professionals to create a better future for the aviation industry. Last but not least, I wish a complete success of this summit. I also wish you pleasant stay here in Shenzhen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chen. And again, to all our distinguished guests for their opening remarks, please another big round of applause for all of them. As you can see from the summit program, we have a full and exciting agenda ahead of us. To set the stage for our deliberation, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome our keynote speaker, Her Excellency Ms. Lydia Chikunga, Deputy Minister of Transport of South Africa, to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Before I begin, please allow me to recognize the presence of Mr. Ryugyu Chen, Mayor of Shenzhen, 
Dr. Fang Liu, Secretary General of ICAO, Mr. Jian Li, Deputy Administrator, Civil Aviation Administration, China, Mr. Zion Lin, President of Chinese Society of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Mr. Shumin Kayo, Chairman of University Council, Beihang University, the Government of the People's Republic of China, and the host city of Shenzhen, ministers and deputy ministers here present, the leadership of ICAO, as well as the Secretariat, and at this stage I wish to thank them for the hard work done in preparation for this conference. Senior officials representing different sectors and different governments, esteemed members of the academia, captains of the aviation industry, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, members of the media. It is indeed a privilege and an honor to address you today at this highly relevant summit of aviation professionals and all the young aviation enthusiasts in attendance here today in participating in this ICAO NGAP Global Summit. The invitation is indeed a great honor, Secretary General, and the rest of the ICAO leadership, and I want to thank you for that. I must also give our warmest gratitude from South Africa for the welcome we have received from the people of Shenzhen and the People's Republic of China. But before I proceed, Program Director, we also wish to sincerely commend ICAO for the opportunities that shall be enhanced and nurtured through this global summit. ICAO's involvement of young people in finding aviation solutions is indeed a gigantic step forward. It is these very young delegates that shall contribute to some of the answers to the question I have to answer, which is, what do we need to know for the 21st century? Alternatively, we might have been asked whether we have a sustainable skills pipeline of aviation professionals with the tools suited to maximize opportunities or to mitigating the challenges we are likely to face in future. This has implications for development of human capital solutions at the center of which must be a sufficient core of, ne of next generation of aviation professionals adequately and appropriately skilled to resolve the opportunities, challenges, and demands of the future. It is my hope that with ideas shared among this generational mix of delegates over the duration of this summit, we shall surely plot a brighter path ahead of us. We meet here to, for two reasons, among others. That is, to spill out the opportunities lying ahead of us for the development of air transport services and to devise globally acceptable means to resolve obstacles that may arise. We believe that partnerships across all sectors of our societies are imperative if we are to realize meaningful outcomes from initiatives that will emanate from the discussions this week. Such partnerships lead to informed decisions and the pooling of much needed resources, including research-based knowledge, capital, and human resources. So program director, what is it that we need to know in order for our industry to thrive in the 21st century and beyond? The first thing we need to know is what is aptly articulated in a quote made by famous Bill King, which says, and I quote him, yesterday is history, today is a gift, and tomorrow is mystery, unquote. In other words, we cannot be certain about what tomorrow is going to bring, except that things would somehow have changed. Agility, flexibility, and innovation have always been at the core of the sustainability of aviation as innovation allows the sector to continuously reinvent and modernize its technologies. To drive the point home, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps let us pause for a minute and look back at the history of flight when mankind decided to take to the sky, to the skies with a powered mechanical device. 
through our ingenuity as humanity, 42,000 days or 115 years ago, the Wright brothers made four brief yet gritty flights at Kit Hawk, conquering vertical distance convincingly for the first time by souring up the skies. Now fast forward that by almost 1,380 months, we currently have aircraft that travel at supersonic speed. Human innovation drives aviation development and will continue long after our generation has retired and we have laid down our aviator sunglasses. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the, it is the very innovative nature of aviation that creates increasing demands for air transport services. Similarly, it is the very same demand that brings social economic benefits to states. Innovation improves safety and security and the efficiencies in the aviation value chain while consistently providing opportunities for entry by new participants. Program Director, I wish that we approach the matter holistically. Not only should we consider innovation in areas of aviation safety and security, we should also consider innovation with regards to aviation associated support services, such as those affecting facilitation. To put this in perspective, let me ask this question. What is the value of developing the fastest aircraft if the passengers, our passengers are going to be stuck at immigration due to the use of archaic systems? The passengers must remain at the core of all innovation meant for the sector, and the skills acquired in line with innovation must finally be geared towards passenger needs of the 21st century. Program Director, it is the very inventiveness and innovative spirit of humanity that has been the source of the fourth industrial revolution gripping the world today, characterized by the fusion of data-driven technologies. It is undoubted that the technological advancements brought about by the fourth industrial revolution have many benefits to the aviation industry, case in point being remotely piloted aircraft system, which have brought efficiencies in the following areas among others, the swift delivery of life-saving medical supplies in remote areas, particularly for the developing countries, adding value in research and development in fields such as mining and agriculture, protection of wildlife, and many others. It is for this reason that we as states and industry ought to embrace these technological advancements. Whilst these are progressive and beneficial, we cannot ignore the unintended consequences they bring to the world of aviation as we know them. This touch on aviation safety, security, and environment, especially their repeat proliferation. If it therefore becomes imperative for states and industry to invest more in training as well as skilling and reskilling of personnel to ensure alignment with new technologies. We need to be prepared for a future in which the familiar human phrase used by the cockpit crew, I mean crew of, I quote, sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight, unquote, will not only be directed to passengers, but will be applicable to the flight crew as well, guided by the artificial intelligence. On the other hand, ladies and gentlemen, more and more organizations, especially in the technological fields, are finding it hard to attract ent entry-level employees with the relevant skills, and so it is with aviation. You would perhaps agree that the shortage of skills is no longer a looming crisis, but indeed a glaring reality. Program Director, as we reflect on the issues of skills, it is also important to take note of the following key pointers. In order to succeed in the 21st century, everyone needs to collaborate and connect digitally. We need to also acknowledge that an industrial age industrial age curriculum will no 
not fully equip future aviators who will have to work and thrive in a data and information driven society and work environment. The fast changing job market may render many skills irrelevant, begging the question, are the current education systems aligned to the new technological advances? Have we identified what skills the next generation of, of aviation professionals will need to meet the demands brought by aviation technological needs? This era of unprecedented changes in a volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world requires agility and speed in order for the aviation industry to remain competitive. A good intergenerational balance is also important as millennials need mentors and organizations need to retain institutional memory and experience for consistency and sustainability. The next generation of professionals is different from you and me, and I may add that they are different from all generations before us. One Jay Gilbert once wrote that millennials are skilled in technology, are able to multitask, have plenty of energy, and are self-confident. Moreover, millennials are inspired by challenges but do value a work-life balance. In fact, they regard work-life balance as very important. So, as in most, the aviation sector will need to make major changes in its human capital management in order to attract and retain talent. We commend ICAO for publishing a forecast to assist states to quantify human resource requirements. As just stated by the Secretary General of ICAO, the ICAO forecast indicates that the industry will need 620,000 pilots, which means that each day we need 67 pilots being produced with greater, I mean for aircrafts with greater than 100 seats. They say 125,000 aircraft controllers will be required, which means that per day we need to be producing 180C. And of course, it says 1.3 million aircraft maintenance personnel by 2036 also must have to be there and produced. In IATA's 2018 edition of the future of airline industry, it is stated that the new era brings different opportunities to the nature and environment of work with a shift towards on-demand work enabled by new technologies and the ability for professionals to work where and when and they want. And for us who are adults, this might actually be frightening, but it is here. It is therefore clear that jobs in the aviation sector are rapidly evolving. This means states would have to add technology-related educational systems to infrastructure development. Furthermore, program director, we are taking note of developments around smart airplanes that can self-diagnose and repair during a flight, and that can also notice and compensate for pilot stress and fatigue. There has also been talk of systems for achieving the correct aircraft response to the pilot's commands, which begs the following questions. Will our pilots be mere technology systems monitors, just focused on monitoring the performance of the aircraft while limited human inter I mean, fixed with limited human interventions? Will our maintenance engineers be part, part fitters due to aircraft self-diagnosis, self-repair, and apply required, required solutions? Would there be a need for warm body air traffic controller, or will we only need someone to punch in the data and let the data systems intelligence and the aircraft system determine the best flight path? So very soon, autopiloting will become a real thing, and not only in relation to certain aspects of the journey, but the entire flight, from the time the engine starts until the aircraft is parked and the engine is switched off. Ladies and gentlemen, for me, 
these are exciting but challenging times. As alluded earlier, we know a bit about what opportunities and challenges we'll face in the future, but there is still a huge gray area that requires precise solutions or at least educated and well-researched guesses and choices. As governments, we must ensure that our policies are aligned to the efforts of those that are trying to develop the industry and not become a hindrance to advancements. We cannot have to entice, we cannot hope to entice the youth to aviation when they are about to enter the job market. We need to start early. In order to ensure a consistent pipeline of human capital, we need to make aviation as well as STEM as fashionable and as exciting as possible from an early age at school foundation phases. If we do not, we will not win the youth over, as aviation has to compete with other careers, career fields that are as exciting and fulfilling. Educational institutions will continue to be the repository of knowledge for our societies. However, they need to realize that the new opportunities and challenges necessitate new and innovative approaches, given that the new generation constitutes a very different type of student. But they can't do it alone. Therefore, collaboration between governments, industries, and academia, particularly education institutions, need to be facilitated, of course, with governments at the helm. Education systems as a whole will need to be reviewed so that they are more flexible, yet focused, and address specific training needs or a highly skilled workforce of creative and lifelong learning individuals. The era of organizations expecting employees to come to work will soon require a thorough review. There will be more emphasis on virtual teams with organizations interested in getting the right skills and use technology to connect to required skills. This would mean that employees would be scattered all over the world and using technology to connect and work together. Program director, as we look at what we need to know in the 21st century, diversity remains key. This became very evident at the inaugural Global Aviation Gender Summit, which was held in South Africa in August 2018. Speaker after speaker indicated the need for gender equity and diversity of gender and age for greater productivity. Therefore, efforts towards creating the next generation of aviation professionals and ensuring gender diversity cannot be mutually exclusive. They Perhaps we should challenge ourselves at this juncture and pose to ask the question, what is my organization doing to ensure diversity? We cannot talk about 21st century without reflecting on some barriers that will inhibit us from achieving what we are seeking to achieve. One of the challenges in aviation is the cost of training aviators in general. In this regard, I believe that states need to facilitate accessibility by working with regulators and the industry at large. Both industry and government need to work together to fund aviation training through instruments such as bursaries, etc. South Africa, a member state of ICAO, and of course, ICAO Council, through the Civil Aviation Authority, we are funding students ranging for, from pilots, aeronautical engineers, to mechanical engineers. However, we acknowledge the fact that this is still a drop in the ocean. We need to do more, hence it is important to galvanize support from all stakeholders in the development of strategies to build a sustainable pipeline of aviation professionals. This can be achieved through collaborative state-to-state -state arrangements as well as public-private partnerships. We also need to start engagements aimed at the establishment of regional aviation academies so that we sustainably educate and train the next generation 
generation of aviation professionals to exploit the opportunities presented by the fourth industrial revolution. Such discussions should also include universities and other institutions of higher learning. There is no sector that can remain competitive without strong leadership. And therefore, the aviation sector also needs to build aviation leaders of the 21st century who possess knowledge of a dynamic sector. E-learning solutions should be considered to increase the accessibility of aviation careers. Outreach programs should be run across all sectors of society in every state in order to demystify aviation as a preserve of the elite. Program director, because of socioeconomic development depends on the development of the aviation sector. Therefore, this calls for the states to build not only the hard infrastructure, but equally measure to develop the softer but with measure, equal measure to develop the softer capacities for the 21st century and beyond. As states, we need to reflect on how we regulate the industry and to what extent the regulations enable learning, research, technology, and innovation in this fast-changing environment. On the other hand, we are, we are bound to ask ourselves, if cyber risks continue to threaten the sector more prominently than terror attacks, what skills should we impart to the next generation professionals and what institutions are there to educate and train against aviation cyber crimes? The collaboration we want is one that leaves no country left behind, not only in terms of compliance, but also in relation to the development of the next generation of aviation professionals. Program director, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, it is my fervent wish that at the end of this summit, we are able to draft an, up an action plan on how we can enhance and increase the human capital development of next generation of aviation professionals. That should be one of ICAO's key priority projects. As South Africa, we'll, we'll be more than happy to support such a project. Together, we can do, we can do more. Chie, chie, I thank you. for your vibrant speech and uh, for raising the right questions. Uh, let's hope that in the next days uh, the summit will have at least uh, uh, opportunity to address this, uh, these um, uh, questions. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, during this summit we will witness several agreements that mark new and expanding working relationship to help us prepare for the need of the next generation of aviation professionals. Before we go to the coffee break, we will take the opportunity to witness the singing ceremony of an agreement between ICAO and the Shenzhen Airport Group, representing the first step of the cooperation in the areas of training, research, innovation, and other fields. It will cultivate international aviation talent for the Shenzhen Airport Group and promote the construction of the International Aviation Hub. I would like to invite to the stage the signatory parties, Mr. Chen Tsingzhu, the president of Shenzhen Airport Group, and Mr. Diego Martinez, the trainer program manager of ICAO. Please. Also witnessing this signature ceremony are the following officials. <laughs> Mr. Chen Rugui, Mayor of the Shenzhen Municipal People's Government. Mr. Ling Ting Jong, member of the party leadership group and secretary general of the Shenzhen Municipal People's Government. Li Ting Jong, Mr. 
Mr. Xiu Song Ming, Deputy Secretary General of Shenzhen Municipal People's Government. Mr. Yu Baoming, Director General of Transport Commission of Shenzhen Municipality. Yu Baoming, Chairman. And Mr. Zheng Hongbo, Chairman of Shenzhen Airport Group. Zheng Hongbo, Chairman. And from ICAO, I would like to invite Dr. Liu Fang, Secretary General of ICAO. Ms. Yang Jiarong, Director of the Office of the Secretary General. Mr. Huang Jifang, Director of the Legal Affairs and External Relations. Mr. Arun Mishra, Asia Pacific Regional Director of ICAO. And Mr. James Wan, Deputy Director, Informational Manager and General Administration of ICAO. Congratulations. Just allow us a few minutes to prepare the stage for the official photo. Another big round of applause. Thank you very much. And now it's time for our first coffee break. Thank you very much. Please return in time for our session at uh, 3.45. Thank you. 3.45. For program, it's time to go over a few housekeeping details. Again, we will be grateful if you would kindly turn off or place on silent mode your telephone and other electronic equipment that might distract from the proceedings. Also, for those interested, all presentation will be published on the IKEO meeting website at the end of the summit. Next, I will encourage you to download the Summit app, which can be found on the App Store by searching for IKEO events. It's a great way to connect with the other attendees and keep track of your agenda. You can learn more about our speakers and moderators from the NGAP website, Summit app, and booklet. All the biographies are published there. The app may be also accessed via a web browser, as indicated on the slide. Please also refer to the app or to the IKEO meeting website for the biographies of all our moderators and speakers, as I mentioned already. If you want to submit questions to our moderators and speakers, you can do it via www.slido.com. The passcode is NextGenAvPro, as indicated on the slide. And all right, it's time for our first panel entitled Fast Forward to the Future. To introduce our panelists, I would like to invite our moderator for this session, His Excellency Mr. Wang Jifang, Director of Legal Affairs and External Relations Bureau of ICAO. Big round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, dear leaders, dear distinguished guests, good afternoon. Now we enter into the next phase, the first panel, fast forward for the future, fast forward probably by aerospace speed. We are fortunate to have a very good panel from different continents. 
For the sake of interest of time, I will not repeat the biographies of our panel members. Suffice it to mention that all of them are distinguished members in international civil aviation. So first of all, I would like to invite Mr. Adam Wells, Head of Policy of DJI, to speak on behalf of the President of his company, Mr. Law. Please welcome. Thank you. Uh, so we've been asked to speak about the future, um, and DJI obviously as the largest manufacturer of uh, small UAVs in the consumer and commercial space has a view of how the future looks from the RPAS or drone side of things. And so I'll keep my comments to three basic areas. One, how I believe drones or, or UAVs are starting to create a new class and a large class of hybrid aviators who do professions and then also fly as part of their jobs. But also that this is now having an impact on manned aviation and the services that support manned aviation and will continue to have more impact, impact into the future. And thirdly, a little bit about what we at DJI are trying to do to ensure that this new technology can be incorporated into the airspace in a safe and manageable way. So, first, the future to a large extent is already here. For our category of drones, there are already 370,000 commercial pilots globally. Now that's a significant number, but even more significant is how rapidly this number has been created. If you went back to the beginning of the decade, you would have been hard pressed to find people using UAVs or drones outside of a few limited academic institutions where they're doing experiments. So this is a very, very new phenomenon. And that creates a, you know, a, an interesting regulatory issue that regulators are dealing with on a daily basis, but it also means that jobs are being created. And so I want to talk a little bit about how this current situation points to what the future holds for our kind of unmanned aviation. The reason that number is so large and it's grown so, so rapidly are basic economics. Across a number of sectors, it is just far more economically viable to use a UAV. If you look at something like construction, somebody may be a trained surveyor, but now by using a drone is able to do the same work at about one-tenth of the cost in terms of man hours and actual cost to the, to the end user. If you look at something like infrastructure, if you're doing uh, an infrastructure check of say a large solar farm, you can save as much as $180 per mile surveyed by using a UAV. And so this new category of aviators, this rapidly new, new, uh, new, newly created category, are often civil engineers or mining engineers slash remote pilot license holders. So they are individuals who have professional qualifications but have also had to go out and become qualified in how to fly a remote vehicle safely. And that's exciting. It's a new category, but it's, a, it's also one that's, that's taking presence in public safety. So if you think about the way public safety agencies would traditionally have used aviation, they might have had helicopters. Helicopters are very expensive. Literally for the cost of one day's operation of a helicopter, you can buy an entire UAV product. And so it's democratized and spread the use of these kinds of technologies. So you have, whether it's firefighting, UAVs are being used to look for hot spots, see where, the, where there are new areas and map the areas of fires, say in California where there's concurrent wildfires. For search and rescue, they are being deployed far more cheaply. And often it's the same kinds of sensors that would have previously been attached to a helicopter, but are now have, have been shrunk down and put onto a UAV. We do a survey of how many lives are saved 
Over the past two years, there's been about 190 people saved just from the use of UAVs by public safety officials. And as you can see, the, the climbing rate in terms of adoption of this technology is very rapid. So first was, we've got this area of, of technology that's creating a new class of aviator. Second is how does this impact on the more traditional manned aviation? We took part, and we were one of many companies that took part, in Project Zenith, or Operation Zenith, at Manchester Airport. And this is an experiment to look at how you can incorporate UAVs into controlled airspace at an airport. And there were a number of different scenarios. Everything from the traditional scenarios we become more familiar with, where you do a survey on the runway far more rapidly and are able to reopen that runway, straight through to things like delivering operational parts for maintenance while the, while the airport is still running. So there are numerous different ways that UAVs can be incorporated in, into this. I would say we learned two things. One, that this is possible. Two, that it's probably not going to happen at every airport anytime soon. It took about 120 people just to put this one project together. And so it's going to take time before this is a scalable solution. But you can see how this is going to start to support the traditional services around manned aviation. In addition, we've worked with American Airlines on a, a project where they're starting to use our UAVs within the hangar to fly over the top of passenger airliners and speed up the turnaround time on checking for, for any maintenance needs. The final piece I want to talk to, so I talked a little bit about this new class of aviation, a little bit about how that might impact manned aviation. But the final point is, how do we do this in a safe manner? Uh, at DJI, we're very respectful of the amazing safety record built over decades in manned aviation. And we want to make sure we don't impinge on that fantastic record in any way, shape, or form. And so we're doing a lot of things on the technology side to try and ensure that our drones are as safe as they possibly can be. Everything from geofencing around airports, so the controlled airspace, you cannot access that unless you have permission from the regulatory authority, and then we do an unlock. Literally, our products won't fly within that area. Through to altitude limitations, an automatic return to home function and obstacle avoidance, and probably more relevant to this audience, ADSB in. We already have this on one of our product lines, and we're looking to expand that so that anybody who is operating near potential manned aviation has advanced warning of an aircraft approaching and can ground and get out of the way. And then the final piece is remote identification. Uh, this is a key part of the Manchester project, which is giving air traffic controllers a view to what's in the, in the sky in terms of UAVs. Uh, and we have a remote ID function, which is built into all of our drones as well. I'll pause there, because I know that we, we have a lot of other uh, comm commentators, and I'll take any questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wells. You certainly have set a good example to deliver the very important issues within the time limits. The second speaker also addresses the issue concerning aerospace innovation. You're talking about UAE, but probably uh, Mr. Michael Tran Van will speak from a, difficult, a different angle. He is the general manager, Airbus Beijing Engineering Center Limited. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Tran Wan. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. First, let me share a little discussions I had with uh, young students. Uh, I took the chance during the coffee break to uh, exchange a very passionate exchange about the history of uh, aviation in the last century. Um, looking at how we first took command fixed wing aircraft off the ground 115 years ago. But the art of flying has been a tremendous adventure for us, and it is still going to be. If we looked at the perspective of development, air traffic is going to double in the next 15 years, and specifically in this area of the world. So I will share from an industrial point of view, and from an Airbus perspective, how we are embracing technologies to tackle those challenges of the future. 
The first one on my side that I would like to highlight is how technology is influencing our product. There are a few trends that we are working on. The first one has been mentioned and it is about electrification. And electrification is a reality in our daily life. Already here in Shenzhen, I'm sure that you have been using electrical uh, taxi to go around. And it is a reality as well for the world of aircraft, where we have solar paneled uh, energized uh, vehicle, like the Zephyr, or the E-Fan. And uh, in the next uh, generation, we'll talk about hybrid solutions for um, uh, uh, aircraft. The second trend I would like to share with you is related to autonomy and how we can go to single pilot, to autonomous flight. This is a trend that we are definitely going to work on that is going to support some of the challenges in regards to uh, pilots. Um, lots of things are being done in that uh, field, connecting at the same time the digital world, the hardware world. We are collaborating with uh, institutes, startups, industrial partners from the car industry. So this is another very exciting trend. The last trend that is impacting our product is related to ecology and how we can use biomaterials, how we can use advanced technologies to recycle all our aircraft. And specifically here in China, we have set up a various number of research projects to progress on that topic. Technology is not only impacting us, influencing us in terms of product. This is as well influencing the way we are working. The way we are working, I'm talking about the factory of the future, how we can make use of further automation and robotics to assemble and deliver all this big number of new aircraft. I'm talking as well about how we can use connected equipment inside factories to increase the performance of our, of our supply chain. And finally, I will talk about the use of a seamless solution from design to manufacturing based on the single digital platform. So these are projects that we are as well uh, progressing today to prepare tomorrow that is related to the ways of working. Talking about technologies, talking about the future, I consider that this cannot be done without mentioning people. We need the skills, we need the talents to continue to help us developing this future. We need the skills in terms of digital awareness, we need some skills about automation, robotics. And there, we have launched a different um, um, number of uh, programs. The latest one being a cooperation with 25 universities around the world to help defining the educational model for the future to feed our needs in terms of competence. We have set up as well a link with universities for research and development because at the end, innovation and the future is fully based on people and the talents that we will be able to develop, to attract, and to retain. So I remain available a bit later for questions and answers, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tramwam, for giving us a short briefing about the development of technology. Autonomous, which may represent the future. The next speaker is Mr. Michel Wackenheim. Mr. Wackenheim is the executive representative of ICCAIA. Please welcome him with our warm applause. Thank you, uh, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, I would like just to remind you uh, what is ICCIA in uh, one slide. Uh, it is, uh, in short, the representation of the manufacturing industry. It is an observer to ICAO and is composed with six member associations that you have on the screen. Europe, United States, Canada, Brazil, Russia, and Japan. 
so I shall not go more details. But uh, uh, second slide is showing figures that you have already listened. You have heard two or three or four times, and you will hear hear this several times. Traffic is doubling uh, within 15 years. The next 15 years, the story doesn't say if it will continue like that for the eternity. But. Uh, uh, it will probably dec decrease, the growth rate will decrease at one moment because this air transport activity is depending very closely from demography and as you know, demography have some limits to the, and there are limits to the population growth on the earth. But for the time being and for the next 20 years, let's trust the economists and the econometric models. So this figure has already been quoted, 500 or 520,000 pilots will be necessary within 20 years, which means given that some of them will uh, retire, uh, the need of 500,000 pilots trained in this period of time. But uh, uh, regarding the figures, I would like just to bring your attention uh, to the, what is important. What is important, as uh, the French uh, pilots, pilot and, and novelist Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said, Regarding the, the future, the most important is not to forecast it, it is to build it, and we are here to build the future. Third slide, it just also a reminder, shows uh, the number of aircraft that Boeing and Airbus intend or forecast for the, this period of 20 years. This means that, on average, five aircraft per day will be produced. It is impressive. All these figures are impressive, but this evolution will rely on deep professional changes, which are more difficult to predict, and I will continue on that issue. This will be my last slide. On the impact of innovation, this is our issue. Impact on, on, of innovation on the flight crew. I would like to make two remarks first. Innovation must guarantee a continuous improvement of safety level. This is the first remark. Today, accident rate is less than 0 0.4 fatal accident per million flight hours. If the forecast is right, within 20 years, it will have to decrease to much less than 0.2 accident on average and in all regions. Second remark is that 20 years ago, 75% of primary cause of accidents was linked to human deficiencies. This figure is today of 52%. This evolution should play also a decisive role in bringing the accident rate down. Regarding technology and the role of pilots, I will not come back to what said my colleague, previous speaker. The role of humans in the aircraft system has evolved and as a result of all this technology innovation, digitization and other things. For the moment, at least, humans act at a higher level of intelligence and intuitions and machines. So the form of intelligence known as artificial is closer and closer to our own. The art of piloting commercial aircraft has thus shifted gradually but fundamentally away from basic initial training. Training in airmanship retains its specificity and still reflects the vocational aspect of the pilot's profession. However, the skills required are very different now and more demanding in terms of scientific and technical knowledge. 
The concept of crew is extended to include all players, including automated systems and the ground. The purpose of automation cannot be to eliminate the human operator. Consequently, human and machine on board must form a crew. The complete crew already includes one or more parties on the ground, which is a tendency that will increase. In the long future, the question could be, why will pilots be necessary on board? Today, I shall say yes. The daily actions carried out by pilots to ensure safe flights are mainly driven by unforeseen events or modification due airline imperatives, which cannot be com comprehensively known to system designers and are therefore impossible to anticipate in flight control software development. So this leads, and other reasons, leads to the conclusion that in 2050 or, or after, there will be still at least one pilot on board. Therefore, the evolution towards greater autonomy is focusing reflections on the single onboard pilot configuration. There are some studies on this configuration which reveal the need for complementary human assistance on the ground, as well as a degree of aircraft autonomy in certain circumstances in order to ensure an acceptable safety level. These constraints argue for one hand, for on one hand, a clear definition of the advantages and disadvantages of abandoning the two-member crew, a configuration which could be appreciably improved, and on a second hand, a careful step-by-step -step approach to implementation of the single pilot configuration. The best compromise must always be reached between safety and operational efficiency with flight monitoring by ground pilots assigned either according to geographical area, thus placing the accent of, on knowledge of the environment, or flight, thus placing the accent on knowledge of the onboard pilot and aircraft resources. The estimated assignment rate could vary on average between five and eight flights per ground pilot. These ground pilots will most likely be experienced pilots who have passed a specific additional training, training module and they will alternate, of course, periods on the ground and periods in the air. There is also an, uh, an aspect which concerns airlines' flight operations, which will be reorganized accordingly, and we, we shall have to define clearly which uh, will be in, con in uh, relation, in communication with the onboard pilots, OCC, the operational control centers, or the ground pilots. This is another question. Finally, uh, the exercise of authority on board will have also to be addressed. It is not easy. When envis envisaging a single onboard pilot, it is vi vital to ensure that they will have the mental and physical availability during the entire flight to carry out the mission. And to clearly define who of the cabin crew or ground support will assist or cover for them and even take on some of their responsibility. So these are a few remarks regarding this question and this issue of, of single pilot and the future of the pilot profession. But there are other aspects and not only pilots are needed. Industry experiences a mismatch between where talents are most needed and where they are more, most available. Recruiting suitable people in emerging markets become a critical task. IT architects, 3D programmers, data modelers, aviation cyber security experts are extremely rare profiles, profiles that make it necessary for the manufacturers to be more active in transnational partnership and with educational institutions. I quote Tom Enders uh, last week which, who said in Brussels, of all people which could cooperate with Airbus in different sectors, 98% are outside Airbus. 
companies are hence putting in place competences strategies in order to secure that the future competence needs are well anticipated and addressed with concrete actions. So if there are some questions, I shall develop these actions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wackenham. Although you represent manufacturers, but you also identify the importance of the pilots. It's necessitate the combination between the machines and persons. And it also calls for the need for the future trainings of the pilots. So this brings us to the next speaker, who is the Vice President of Civil Aviation Flight University of China, a training institute, Mr. Ou Yang Ting. So let's give him a warm welcome, Mr. Ou Yang Ting. Respected uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity on behalf of our institution to share with you our practice of the pilot training. And I would like to touch your point four perspectives. One is some of the fundamental introduction of our institution. by two thinkings, followed by two thinkings, as well as our practices, as well as features, loss is the future developmental direction. And undoubtedly, for the Civil Aviation Flight University of China is the biggest pilot training institution in China, so for the world, we were called the cradle of the civil pilots in China. After uh, since the previous 20 odd years, we already provided more than 30,000 30, professional pilots. And for our vice director, Vice Director of the CAA was uh, Mr. Li Jian, is actually an alumni of us. We are proud of him. And our annual training of the pilots is close to 300,000 hours, according to more than one third of all the general aviation training currently. All of the training time is around 800,000 hours. And there was a data that if the number Decrease, it is because of our summer or winter holiday. So our activity is greatly influencing the Chinese activities. And secondly, we have an outstanding safety, secure, uh, safety management capacity. And due to the past 20 years, our accident rate is 1 25th of the global general aviation, as well as 1 fourth of the North American countries accident rate. And our graduate has been widely recognized by the industry. It is known that for May the 14th, Sichuan Aviation Corporation had one of the uh, airplanes whose wing shield has broken. And despite of the broken of the pilot copies glasses, they still managed to land the airplane safely, despite of the fact that one of the co-pilots has been stuck up. Uh, out of the plane uh, only being attached to the seat uh, with the seatbelt. Actually, all of the crew came from our institution. 
And this slide preview about our past 62 years of Chinese history. There are two things we've been insisting and persisting. One is what's the difference between a professional pilot and someone who can fly a plane? And who, some people who can fly a plane, as far as anyone got the license, they can fly a plane, it can be a doctor, a lawyer, entrepreneur. But the professional pilots are different. Professional pilot having a license is just one of the most fundamental conditions. This is actually different from anyone that can fly a plane. I can fly a plane, and if there is a good weather, I can fly. I don't need to fly in all conditions and to all destinations. For a professional pilot, you have to fly in any given weather as well as any given circumstances. It required a very high level of knowledge, learning capacity, professionalism as well as uh, psychological anti-pressure uh, uh, qualities. So actually, we have an integrated training model. Um, model of the degree plus license plus English. Actually, different countries and different time have different challenges. And for China, currently, the general aviation is underdeveloped. We do not have a way that the pilot can fly in general aviation before flying in professional or transportation aviation. Usually, the pilots are graduated from universities or academies and directly being employed by AV, uh, airlines. So we need to have a very different kind of the training models compared with the countries with a very developed general aviation sector. And of course, along with the change of the times. And in the past, the pilots were maneuver or operator. However, currently, the pilots is already changed from an operator to a manager. Actually, in the coming 20 years, with a rapid development of the te technologies, I heard Michelle said that AI might play the role in the future operation. And TND pilots, actually, we are starting that too. And outside, we have a VR augmented uh, reality and enhanced reality. These are all changing the way we are training the pilots. Actually, with new technologies, we also need to innovate the ways we uh, train the pilots. For our academy, there are several practices, and this is what are we doing. One is currently we have a very comprehensive discipline system provides a strong support for the flying professionals. And to build a good subject, actually, we need a very strong fundamental support, like pilot training, as an example. The pilots need to acquire information about the structure of the plane. We have aviation um, engineering, and they need to know about uh, air control. They need to know English. So we have uh, foreign language uh, um, sorry, institutions. So this all provides solid con support for the pilot training. And secondary, we have a very strong research capacity. We've been doing training for 62 years. We have numerous data to research. We also have a key laboratory of the aviation uh, administration. We also have various kind of expert teams to ensure our leadership in the research effort. Besides, we also have professional pilot teachers or instructors so that the training is conducted in a professional way. All of the teachers are dedicated teachers. They are full-time teachers. They need to acquire the uh, pilot teacher's license as well as the C 
senior educational institution license, which is different from other training institutions. And besides, currently, for our institution, we are talking with various airlines. And in the future, we want to allow the majority of our tutors and trainees to have experience of uh, transportation. You know that for other training academies, a lot of pilots, they want to accumulate air time through being a teacher there and then to accumulate, um, <coughs> to accumulate, then to go to airlines. But actually, we want to accumulate transportation uh, time in order to improve our teaching activities. Last but not least, there are some of our future directions. First of all, what are we doing now? There is a training based on knowledge of capacity instead of based on subjects and times. We all know that the countries have various requirements, and for China, we have different requirements. And basically, they're all based on the Appendix 1 of IKO. Actually, this uh, Appendix 1 is already 40 years old. I think that the training based on subjects and time need to progress with the development of technology as well as areas. We also need to enhance or to use more new technology in the pilot training. So this is very similar with other speakers. So last but not least, it is our responsibility and mission to cultivate more outstanding professional policy. Thank you. Thank you, Profession, uh, Professor Ouyang, for your excellent presentation concerning the cultivation of the new generation of the pilots. And he especially mentioned the uh, hero crew. And in order to be a qualified pilot, they need to have good skills as well as very good professionalism so they can handle crisis as well. This is something we all need to put some thoughts in. Will be Mr. Han Hoff, head of the IQ and concept unit of Eurocontrol. He will address the issue of how will automation chains in air navigation services impact the aviation system. So let's give uh, Mr. Hoff a warm welcome to the floor. Excellency, Secretary General, dear colleagues, um, next aviation professionals, it's an honor to talk about this subject today, and it's even more a challenge to do that in six minutes. Um, I would like to start with uh, some words that I wrote down some years ago. A good future is not a simple extrapolation of the past, but it is born and raised from the challenges of the future, and people make it happen. So what are the challenges that we are facing? Just one slide. Growing numbers of air traffic. We know this. We know these numbers out of many forecasts. But also many other things. We have drones. We have new entrants flying above um, in the higher airspace by fly above flight level 600. So all these new developments are ahead of us that we are facing. But also we are facing a continuous care about the natural airspace user the bees and the birds, our environment. So all this together represents the challenge of the future. Now what is the system that we are working with today? We have a great system, we are managing quite a lot of traffic already, but how does it look like? How did it evolve from the past? We see that the actors in the air traffic management environment largely still communicate using voice over radio and using procedures. It's a safe system. It can generate a lot of throughput still today. 
all these actors are supported by automation. And that, that is good, this automation has developed. But automation is not interconnected. And the result of that is that we see that we have different plans in the systems. Uh, we file a flight plan, but this flight plan is not followed, uh, it's not maintained, and that generates levels of uncertainty which we can cope with today. But can we cope with this in the future? So how will this system in the future look like? Fundamental is information. Information that we share in a secure and reliable manner. Information that we maintain. Through ICAO we develop the system-wide information management concept and this is already subject of development and implementation over the world uh, as part of large-scale development and implementation programs. Based on good and reliable and secure information, we can base automation. And here you see three letters, TBO, trajectory-based operation. Trajectory-based operation is that you share the trajectory and maintain it throughout the flight, before departure until the, the flight has finished. This trajectory becomes the, the basis of collaborative decision-making that can support automation and is supported by automation. That is very, very important and it will change the role of the human. This is an unavoidable change that we have to face. The human is at the moment still in a cognitive role in our system, but it will change over the future. And this is a change that we need to carefully manage. This does not happen overnight. In ARKEO we develop and we have the Global Air Navigation Plan, a plan that contains the path towards this future. We also started to address in this plan the human factors. We, we started to address how all these changes are affecting the role of the human in order to be able to anticipate this in all kinds of manners. But there is more. We also need to focus on how we are going to develop and how we are going to develop and implement it. What we see, and you in the city, you have just to look around you, we see a rapid evolution of technology. This is not going linear, this is an exponential growth. When we look at aviation, we see a more conventional evolution. We still have quite old systems in operations today. If we extrapolate that past, the gap between technology and what we can do in aviation becomes only bigger. And this is something that we need to avoid. So we need to go through a paradigm change, implementing the concepts like system-wide information management, trajectory-based operation, changing the role of the human in a responsible and manageable way. And that requires new skills. It requires skills not only specialists on cyber, on automation, on artificial intelligence, on machine learning, but also soft skills, inspirational people, people that think out of the box and involved leadership. All these skills are needed in order to make this future happen and make aviation go through this necessary paradigm change. So ladies and gentlemen and aviation, next aviation professionals, I hope you go through a transformational change that you develop, that you fly out, face the future and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoff. Both you and Professor Ouyang, previous speaker, mentioned that the, the difference between the pure operator and the manager of the future system. So this is a, a quantum leap for the future. And we are also lucky to have Mr. Patrick Peters, who exactly managed the air traffic control system. Mr. Patrick Peters is the president of the chief executive officer International Federation of Air Traffic Controllers Association. Let's give him a warm welcome.
Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to uh, extend two thanks. One to ICAO for having me at this summit. Thank you to Michelle, Steve, and Catalin for having invited me. Secondly, I would like to thank the Eurocontrol Agency, who is my employer back home, who uh, allowed me to change a couple of shifts and do some magic to my shift roster in order to get some days off to, to come here and attend the summit. Um, I will be talking for sure about technology, innovation, automation, but I will also touch a little bit upon responsibility that we need to rethink, predictability, finding the right balance, and staffing, and who does it in the end. I was given the question up front of how will new innovations affect the role of the air traffic controller in the future? And I'd like to correct that question a little bit because I think it puts the focus on the wrong thing. It puts the focus on the innovation affecting us as controllers. Whereas I would like to see how can we as air traffic controllers make use of the innovations to make us ready for the future. Talking about technology, innovation, and automation. I can take the scare off anybody who thinks as an air traffic controller we wouldn't be needed in the future anymore. Automation or any form of new technology or innovation has so far not replaced the human. It has merely created some more capacity for handling the increasing traffic. Staffing requirements, and we heard it earlier today, according to an ICAO study, by the way, reveals that we have a student shortfall or a training shortfall of at least 40,000 air traffic controllers globally until 2030. And there are other figures extrapolating that until 2036. But let's talk about staffing a little later. Coming back to automation and what I call the myth of automation. Automation and autonomy are often misused and mixed up. Autonomy relates specifically to self-determination and independence of decision-making. However, whilst forms of automation can include such independence, the scope of automation is much broader than this and captures a wider spectrum of functions. But taking into consideration the human aspect, the human-centered approach, and the evolution, as we hear it, for example, in Europe in the CESAR context, IFATCA, our organization, much rather prefers to talk about the increased use of technological support and building in resilience. Following the idea of the code is the law, and you probably ask me what, what do you think about it? The code is the law. Nowadays, everything needs to be programmed if we're talking about technology. And for as long as it is not programmed, it's not going to happen. This is the myth of automation, the substitution idea, that we can substitute the human by automation. And the preliminary report of the latest Lion Air accident hints into a way of, if it's not programmed, it's not foreseen, and it's not going to happen. Wrong. Following the substitution method of function allocation, we would be confronted with a vision that only predicted consequences of automation will occur. This is not the case. You might have heard about Maba Maba, men are better at, machines are better at. That is the substitution philosophy. We have to stop dividing things up. The main focus of system design shall not be the creation of artifacts per se, but getting to understand the nature of the human practice in a particular domain and changing this uh, work practices rather than adding new technology, rather than adding another layer of complexity or replacing human work with machine work. So the best buy is the transformation from human versus machine to human and machine. We have to move away from the competition factor between human and machine to a complementary approach. The involvement of the end user from the very beginning is absolutely crucial. Otherwise, you don't have that buy. You don't get that buy-in. And you would have a much more costly implementation of systems, increasing training, 
time and money, loss in productivity, and you end up with controllers having to work around, or pilots, such, uh, pilots just the same, work around. All too often in my almost 30 years of career as an air traffic controller, I have been confronted with technology where I ended up being the test bed for it. We couldn't implement it properly. Take, for example, CPDLC, Pilot Controller Data Link. One of the major examples that my agency has been busy with for more than 25 years. I work Data Link every day, but it doesn't work. It works sometimes, and then you have days where it doesn't work. And then you create workarounds. And this is not what technology shall be about. So please, all you engineers in the room, give us technology that works. Thank you. As an example how technology can assist, it can be complementary. That's a picture from Hyundai where they use technology to lift heavy machinery. And both are involved, technology and the human. I want to talk briefly, not to exceed too much of my delay that I have to make up here, um, on accountability, safety, just culture, and responsibility, systemic safety. When we look at involving uh, machines and human likewise, we have to also, when we do this shift, we also have to shift from responsibility and accountability for as we know it so far, but mainly the finger pointing who did what wrong, to a more system-wide approach, the systemic safety approach. Um, there shall not be any more in the future a division between us and them. For me talking as a controller and the engineers on the other side. It has to be a holistic approach. We have to find ways of making things better. This will require a cultural change. We need to envisage this cultural change and be open for it. Another brief remark on predictability. predictability. Airlines put a lot of pressure on us as air traffic controllers out on the system by wanting it more predictable. The more predictable it is, the better the revenue for the airline companies. But you can't have predictability if you want the flexibility on the other side and the stability on the third side. And this is what this uh, Haijunku, the Japanese um, balancing triangle shows. It means we need to be in balance. We cannot have one or the other. If I want to be predictable, I can do it to a certain degree, but I need to have the flexibility to intervene to make it also predictable and stable. Just a thought. My last point um, is about staffing and recruiting. We've heard that earlier on. Sorry, the slide doesn't translate very well from Mac to Windows. People nowadays like variation. We are in a different era, different generations, whereas when I became an air traffic controller some 30 years ago, we knew that we would do that for life. If you see the next generation coming up, they will do it for a few years, and then they want to change. They want the versatility, they want the variation. And this puts a heavy burden on us in the, in the aviation industry, because we might have to replace those people that are wandering off into other great jobs. Because we're fishing, and we heard that earlier today as well, we're fishing from the same pool of technology, technology advanced and trained personnel and the trainees. There are other cool jobs out there that those young people want to do, not only ATC. Salary is also not often anymore a problem, at least in many countries and for many service providers. It is the life-work balance that makes the whole thing run. More people look into their lives being an internal thing rather than going for building up funds for having yet another flashy car. And our industry is vulnerable. Shifts 24-7, monotonous work, stressful, sometimes not very productive or not productive in the, in the way of producing something. Responsibilities, accountability, competition. In Europe we currently, one minute, in Europe we currently have 
in a small country close to the Alps, we have five cases where we talk about prosecution of air traffic controllers for having done mistakes. That's Europe, and we're fighting these cases. We're trying to provide assistance to our controllers over there. It's finger pointing, it's media made uh, hype against air traffic controllers. So this is something, this has to stop if we want to get the right people into this profession. Thank you very much. Xie Xie. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Uh, I hated to interrupt you because your speech was such excellent speech. Uh, both you and uh, Mr. Wackenheim both mentioned the combination between human and machine, which is quite important. You also mentioned quite a few things that touch my heart. You're talking about the code is law, you're talking about accountability, you're talking about prosecutions. This is coming to my profession as a lawyer, probably some of you do not know. So not just we need the technological expert, we also need the future generation of aviation lawyers. So you save me a speech. <laughs> Thank you. So we still have a few minutes. I would like to reserve this for question. There's one question. Is there any guarantee that UAV will not interfere with other air traffics? How can ATC interact with the pilot of UAV in terms of violation being conducted by UAV? Supposedly I should give it to the first to the Airbus and probably to the air traffic controller because one represents the manufacturer, another represents the controller. <laughs> and, I'm sure, and I'm sure the DGI would like to add uh, something about that one as well. Um, in Airbus, we are thinking about air mobility. So uh, urban air mobility in the sense that uh, there is a trend in the world where we have more and more mega cities. There is a need to deliver a seamless solution to travel inside the cities and certainly using uh, vertical takeoff and landing machines, uh, certainly electrical and certainly autonomous in terms of uh, piloting. Um, the challenge is not so much the technological uh, challenge. Um, our families, our friends will use those machines. And for sure, we need to ensure that in this environment, and this urban environment, we can guarantee the highest level of safety for those uh, people. Uh, which means that uh, this is a collaboration between um, uh, regulations, between as well um, urban landscapers, um, aircraft manufacturers, um, hand in hand to define solutions to ensure that uh, we do not have any risk of flight collisions, of any accident, and this is uh, indeed um, um, the key challenge for the future. And the last one, because I liked, uh, please engineers make something work. Uh, I am an engineer by heart, so indeed uh, we always try. And one of our challenges is to make it work and to continue to work in the long time. Flying machines talk to us, now we need to learn to listen. So what it means is we can receive a lot of information from any of our aircraft. If we learn to listen, if we learn to interpret those information in terms of distance, in terms of uh, collision risk, then this is indeed uh, um, a key enabler to ensure safety into uh, urban air mobility and uh, UAV. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Wells, uh, do you have any supplement remark? Sure. I, I mean, I think you have to divide the question slightly. I mean, you have uh, large UAVs that operate at the same altitude as manned aviation, and that would need to be incorporated in the same way as manned aviation, correct? It has to be part of the air traffic control system. And then you have the sort of UAVs that uh, DJI manufactures, which operate below 400 feet by regulatory mandate, and are quite different, but still, unfortunately do invade controlled airspace at times. And so we've done a number of things on the technology front to try and keep 
these small UAVs out of the controlled airspace. We have geofences around every single airport, around, which extend five kilometers out. And we're now moving to more of a bow tie configuration for those geofences to cover the approach and takeoff path to make it safer. But geofencing is not foolproof. So the question, can you really ensure that there is no conflict, is a real issue there. And the, the other issue is also how do you start to allow for more operations inside controlled airspace? Airports, airlines, they want to use UAVs. Whether it's for inspections of runways or of actual passenger aircraft, they want to start to incorporate UAVs in that controlled airspace. And that's going to require some sort of unmanned traffic management system which may be tied into the ACC. Uh, the, the, the experiment that I talked about, Operation Zenith, actually used our aeroscope system along with 4G connectivity and other, other technologies to experiment with how the ATC could be kept apprised of all of the UAV traffic within their area and they could interact with it. But it is a legitimate problem. It hasn't, hasn't been fully solved yet. Thank you. Ms. Peters, do you have any one minute? One minute. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's say I have to differentiate here. I'm, I'm not really that um, scared about the big ones that are flying upper airspace or medium airspace that are um, controlled by professionals. These are trained personnel. We have a few issues with the lost link mode. There are things that we can work on, but I think we're on the right track there. Um, the bigger problem we see, and this is also where the majority of incidents is coming from, are unfortunately what you produce, the small amateur ones that everybody can buy everywhere, and it's a cool piece of technology. I've got one myself. It's, I'm, I'm not against this, but the problem is accountability here again, people not being trained, not knowledgeable about the limitations, where they can fly and what they can do with it. Geofencing is one possibility to keep them off areas that are, that are forbidden for them. Um, I think, and as you quite rightly say, we are on the right track there. We're not yet there. It's still a lot, of, lot to go. But I would push more on well, one side is the technological side, the geofencing, but I would also like to go on the, on the state side, the licensing, the training for even the Patrick Peters that wants to fly his Mavic around the world. I, I need to be trained on this, and you should only buy these once you have had a certain certification and are being made aware of the responsibilities. Nobody tells you unless you look for it right now. You can buy them somewhere on the internet. Nobody tells you what your responsibilities are unless you look for it. This has to change. Can I have one quick rebuttal? Uh, we actually launched a, a digital quiz in a number of markets, and we're extending it out, which actually requires somebody to actually take a quiz and be aware of operational guidelines, not flying within an airport, not flying within 30 meters of an individual, depending on the jurisdiction, before you can fly. So we are working on it. It's not perfect, but we're, we're getting there. But this is something you're doing, which is remarkable, which is nice, but I would like the state to take a regu regulatory... No, thank you. I have to stop of. you. Sorry. <laughs> because this can be itself a two-day discussion. To my knowledge, IQ have two groups. One is ANB, and Navigation Bureau. One is in the legal bureaus. So let's come to IQ to continue that discussion. Uh, our time is up. Let's first give a very warm applause to our experts in this group again. Uh, secondly, that's not the end of story. I would like to summary just only two sentences. One is, there is a job opportunity for you. Don't worry about that, but you have to learn. If you don't learn, you will not get the jobs. Secondly, I can say no country left behind. Very sadly, my generation will be left behind because you will surpass us. At this juncture, I would like to recite the words of the president, founding president of this People's Republic, which has encouraged me, and I hope it will also encourage you. I'm sure some of you know this quotation. The world is yours and the world is ours, but after all, the world is yours. The young people, you are lively, and you are like the sun in the morning, and you embrace all the hopes of the world.
thank you, Jifang, and uh, I think uh, uh, they deserve a big round of applause, another one. Excellent panel, excellent presentation, excellent interaction. And now I would like to uh, invite our uh, next uh, guest, Mr. Charles Bombardier. He's a uh, senior NGAP advisor to ICAO, and uh, he will uh, be here with us to announce the next ICAO initiative to support young researchers and innovators. The floor is yours, Charles. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, my name is Charles Bombardier. I was a trained uh, engineer, but I'm also an angel investor, so I invest in small startups. I also do some research at the university, and uh, I'm, uh, I sit on boards uh, of companies. About five years ago, I started uh, working in industrial design. I invited people to share ideas openly around the world, including supersonic aircraft and all types of uh, flying vehicles. And because of that, ICAO asked me to join them and to start collaborating with them about the future of aviation. So today, our objective is to promote and create content and experiences to inspire the next generation of aviation professionals. We would like to do that by working with inventors from around the world who have ideas about the future of aviation. We are also working with industrial designers who can convert these ideas into images. Scientists on their part could help us uh, describe new technologies that could be implement, implemented in those vehicles. And students, of course, are the people who will help us build those vehicles or build those strategies or those systems. So the way we're going to work uh, in the next uh, few months and few years is going to we're going to try to approach children in primary schools and help them uh, discuss with us discuss with us about the future of aviation. What do they have in mind? How do they see the future? We'll also work with teenagers and students in university. All these people have different skill sets. So for teenagers, uh, it will be designing uh, printing models. For students in university, it could be building an actual flying prototype. So what are we going to do? We're going to do this by creating content for them. We're going to be building tools also. One of those tools will be will, is 2D images that are created weekly at ICAO. We're creating images of airships, supersonic jets, aircrafts, helicopters, and so on and so forth. All these images can be uh, shared socially on all media platform, meaning that people see these inventions and they start talking about it. What we want is for kids to start talking about it in school. That's the first thing. Second thing is uh, creating 3D models. Why 3D models? It's because these can be used in VR experiences. And as you know, VR is on the rise. People want to see machines, they want to go into them. So instead of building a multi-million multi dollar prototype, you just build a 3D model and it can be done in a week and people can go inside and try it out. Once this is done, we can also build animations. We can also uh, put all of this content into a website. And we can also share them with a book. So today I'm going to show you a, a, things, a few things we've created over the last three months since I've joined ICAO. This is an example of the 2D image uh, I was talking to you about. 
Every one of you, you're, uh, if you need all of these images for your presentation, you'll be able to use them. They'll be into the IKO's website. So if you need an airship, if you need a drone, if you need a, a plane, if you want us to modify something, if you want us to invent something, we can do it for you. Our job is to get the word out there. Our job is to get those images online and inspire the next generation. This is a, an example of a 3D animation we did. We, we only create short clips of a two or a 10 seconds. So this is very inexpensive to create and it's a good way to, to, uh, to carry out a message to your crowd. So if you have, if you have to make a presentation in school or uh, at work, it's easy for us to, uh, to provide you with those types of images. Next thing, like I said, we're creating 3D content that can be used in VR experiences. What we would like to do this year is to provide those experiences to scientific museums across the world. So in your country, if you have a science center or if you have a high school or university that would like to have our IKO experience, it will be made available to them. And we all, uh, the, the experience is also available on any types of uh, platform like Oculus Rift or uh, Microsoft HoloLens. And of course, over the months, we'll be releasing more and more experiences. This is a way to get the discussion going. This is an example of what we've done. Sorry about that. It's, it's in the lobby and you can try it out if you want. In this experience, you're able to visit a museum showing the vehicles of the future. So the next step is to create an animation. If you want to talk about a specific subject, we create an animation around that subject. Today I'm going to show you uh, a subject revolving around urban flight. We're all thinking about what's coming up in our cities, how we're going to make those uh, flying corridors, how, how people are going to react to that. So one thing to do, uh, we, we, we thought about doing is creating a small animation so that people can, people can start thinking about this uh, and start uh, exchanging. If you want to talk to your mayor, if you want to talk to your, uh, to your government officials, we can create small animations like the one you're going to see.
I hope you liked it. So, uh, thank you. So this is the kind of thing we can do here at IKO with the NGAP program. We can create a vision of the future. So if you have a vision you would like to create, we can do it with you. We're working right now on a disaster response uh, uh, animation, so we have to create a storyboard, We've t we have to talk about drones and all these kinds of things. So this is the kind of, uh, of uh, inspiring uh, animation we can create. I'm going to wrap, uh, wrap this up rapidly. We have now, we are now launching a website that will uh, host a contest. The contest will uh, target, like I said, kids in primary school, secondary school and university. And on this website, you'll be able to register uh, depending on your age. The uh, registration process is very, very easy. You specify your name, talk about your idea, and you upload some images of, of our sketches. So if you know someone in school that's good with sketches, you can create the sketch. And at this point, IKO can help in many, in many ways, many forms. What we want is to find the, the, the most promising students and uh, integrate, in, integrate them into the process of IKO so they can become a, a professional. Of course, uh, all of this is a work in progress. We just started uh, three months ago. We have decided to create a book for the event. The book uh, is featuring prototypes that are actually being built in the world today. So we are uh, in the book, you'll be, uh, you'll be handed out uh, at the VR booth. You'll see uh, companies that are making prototypes and you'll also see concepts uh, that come from uh, our community of collaborators. If you have people in your country that have, that have a small startup and that want to be featured in our book, no problem, send us the info, we'll try to get them on board. If you know the people that have good designs or ideas about the future of aviation, send, us, send it to us. It'll, uh, it'll be the next book that we'll be uh, trying to publish uh, by the end of the next year. This is, an, uh, this is just an image of, to show you the book. And that uh, wraps up my, uh, my presentation. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Charles. Indeed, uh, we are looking into the future and how we can better outreach to the to the younger generation it's one on the way of the way that we are trying to put in place in order to uh, accomplish what we are uh, thinking to to make uh, aviation a desirable um, future uh, job right now uh, i want to thank you uh, for uh, being so uh, patient with us we are a little bit uh, late but um, uh, today this evening we will uh, complete our program with a uh, uh, very important event for all of us. Um, the NGAP Summit uh, combines uh, all this uh, true productive presentation and discussion with the moment of reflection of the future. And uh, the summit also offers opportunities for uh, teams who wish to join efforts to facilitate access to STEM education, specifically aviation and air transport related jobs for male and female students to come together. The the following segment of the program is a testimony of the spirit of great cooperation. And uh, I am excited and deeply honored to welcome Dr. Fang Liu, Secretary General of the International Civil Aviation Organization, and Mr. George Xu, CEO of Airbus China, to the podium. On behalf of their respective entities, Dr. Liu and Mr. Xu will be formalizing the intent to collaborate on steps to capacitate young students, both male and female, on STEM and aviation. In the near future, 
team of both ICAO and Airbus will be working together to engage students on research into aviation in support of sustainable development. They will also look into offering students, males and females, with internship possibilities at ICAO, allowing young people to become familiarized with a UN specialized agency and its regulatory and normative practices to support safe, secure, economically viable, efficient and environmental friendly aviation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu and Mr. Xu, and uh, we encourage all the partners and stakeholders all over the world to, to follow the, the, the initiative and to work together for a better future. Thank you very much. And this concludes our first day, and we are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you once again. All the best.